Welcome to The Voice of One Crying in the Wilderness. This ministry is founded on Mark 1-3, The Voice of One Crying in the Wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. After seeking the Lord in prayer, our name was given to us by the Lord. We invite you to like us on Facebook, The Voice Crying in the Wilderness. You can reach us by emailing our address, which stands for A Voice of One Crying and the year we began it, that line. That email address is a v o o c two zero one nine at gmail dot com. This evening we're blessed to have Brother Courtney Jackson from Revelation of Hem Ministries provide our message. Doctor Jackson, the time is now yours. Good afternoon. Good after e- good evening to all who are online with us. It's al- always a privilege and honor to be on to study God's word. I'm going to say a word of prayer, and then we'll go into our message. This evening, we will be looking at the prophecy of the book of Obadiah. We started on it last time, and we'll continue through Obadiah. Let's pray. (laughs) Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we thank you again for the opportunity to study thy word. We ask the blood of Jesus to cover our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We invite the Holy Spirit to guide our minds as we look at Obadiah and his prophecy. And Lord, let it be that we'll learn lessons for our time, that we will be prepared for that great and final day where you call a rec- call all to a reckoning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in Obadiah. The book of Obadiah has only 21 verses and is only one chapter, basically. What it looks like, we'll probably uh, cover this afternoon will be the first ten verses. I'm going to read down the book of Obadiah from verse 1 to verse 10, and then we'll come back through it and we'll comb through it. The vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart have deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, where... Whose, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. If thieves, if thieves came, to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the great gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and have prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men 
out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau. And thy mighty men, O Timon, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Obadiah, verses 1 through 10. Now, in our introduction to the book of Obadiah, we understand that the name Obadiah means servant of Yahweh. Now, the Bible, and I should probably read this for you, We'll go all the way to the last book of your Bible, the very last book of the Bible, chapter 1. That book is called Revelation. The complete name is the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And it reads, the Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, Show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. And he went and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Okay, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. These words say, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. My question, dear Bible student, is the writer here talking about Revelation? Or is he talking about the whole Bible? Now, in our Bible school, here in our online Bible school, one of the other things we're going to learn is that there's a primary application, there's a secondary application. Any verse, all verses, no verse in the Bible has only one meaning or one application. It doesn't exist. God is infinite. So when we understand the terminology book, we can take the book, Genesis to Revelation, in total, we can understand that Genesis to Revelation are prophecies in total, historic parables, which literally are history that happened and their symbolic meanings in the story. And we decipher those. And here in Revelation, it says in verse 1, to show unto his servants. Now that's interesting. Because Obadiah, the name means servant of Yahweh. So this is the Obadiah, but this is also going to refer back to Obadiah. I hope you're following me. So Revelation 1.1, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. That's going to be true for all the other 65 books of the Bible. 
And it continues in verse 1 and says, And he sent and signified. The word signified is a uh, complex um, tense of the the uh, infinitive, I think, would be the word. I'm not an English teacher, but the word sign is the root and we have signified, signified. So the book, Revelation, the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, are written in signs and symbols, hence historic parables and prophecies. In other words, they all point and speak about the same thing, the Lamb of God, the Christ, the Creator, the Redeemer, and explain the path of salvation. They give warnings. Repent. Turn back. Don't do that, which you have been doing, which is against the word of God. The messages don't change in their objective and purpose from book to book to book to book for 65 books. Just like God is three divine beings, and he's one God, we have 66 books making up one book. Okay. So, when we look then at the vision of Obadiah, the servant of Yahweh, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom, the Bible has defined Edom as the country, the nation, the people of the posterity of Esau. Esau is the twin brother of Jacob, born to Rebekah and Isaac, that fought in the womb of Rebekah. And when we look at Jacob and Esau, and maybe I should read some of this for those who may not be so familiar with the story. Let's go back to Genesis. We're going to go back to Genesis. And we're going to look at this battle. We're in the book of Genesis. And we're here in chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25, reading from verse 19. And these are the generations of Esau, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Pandanaram the daughter of Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, There were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Jacob was three, four years old when she bare them. 
So there you have the beginning, the birth of Jacob and Esau. And follow how the Bible is written. We went to Revelation 1.1. And John there tells us that things are written in a symbolic way, by sign. The word he uses, signified. Now, dear listener, what that means is God is going to speak to you in your life, in the circumstances of your life. This is why it's so important for you to read the Bible over and over and over and over in a systematic way. A systematic way covering from book to book, chapter to chapter, and verse by verse. On my website, Revelation of Him, which is at www.revelationofhem.org, there's a method of Bible study. You can download the Effective Bible Study and Spiritual Growth Plan. If you call that plan, it's systematic. And you'll study Genesis through Revelation using the eight books that are listed there. And it would take you two to three years. But because you use that method with these commentaries, those commentaries, you will cover the basis of every book of the Bible. Now, why is that so important? Well, the simple question, dear listener, what experience are you going to have today? You don't know. And I sure don't. But God knows. But God has given us examples in the history of the Bible so we can see how God dealt with every type of situation and circumstance that will happen in an individual's life. It's in the Word of God. That relates to the most important thing in a man or a woman's life. Salvation. Redemption from sin. Deliverance from this world of wickedness. So, symbols, signs. That means God would work the same way by circumstances in your life. But you will not be able to read the signs and symbols that God is speaking to you second by second and hour by hour and moment by moment and day by day and week to week and the months go by and then the years go by and people say, I don't know the purpose of life. But if they would only study, not simply read, but study the Word of God, that question would be answered. And it's right in front of our face. But we have to read. We have to study. Paul told Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman. You're working on your own character. And what is the purpose of these books? One of them. God sends a message. There is prophets. And I say a message. The message of salvation is singular through all 66. One message, one objective, but in different packages because everybody has a different circumstance and a different need. But as we study these different packages and circumstances, we can then find the one that exactly fits your circumstance. And as you see how to pray, how God will deal with you, then the Bible becomes a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And you can see and you can navigate. But aside from that, as was mentioned, God gives a message from the beginning. And he says, certain things need to be done. 
because in the end I am going to call to a reckoning. And so God can only be just if he says the objective. He sends a messenger to tell people, turn away, turn away, turn away. And they can decide whether they're going to listen or whether they're not. And this is what will condemn you or redeem you in the judgment day. Dear listener, dear brother, dear sister, it is very easy to see in the world. If you've never read the Bible before, you can look and see, you know, maybe the world is going to end. When? Very soon. How long can the world go on with the agitation, the rumors of war, the wars, the pestilence, the famine, the distress, the collapse of society? And so of all the places God has given a warning in his word, And blessed be the name of the Lord, because you, with the two ears listening, can hear that and heed to it today. And so God in his justice, oh sure, the prophets, they give fearful messages. But these are messages of love. It's turn back, turn back. The whole bus, the whole train is about to go off a cliff. Get out. Go to safe ground while you can. That's the message symbolically. Now in the complicity of our story, from the beginning, there's a rule of first mention. And Jacob and Esau are the first mention of these two people. Israel, eventually, and Edom. In the womb, they're struggling, they're fighting. And God tells the mom, Rebecca, the church, symbolically, there's going to be two people. So, when we see this, there's going to be two, I shouldn't say two people, he said two nations. Two nations. There's going to be two groups of people, two nations, in the world at the end of time. The righteous and the wicked. One will be stronger than the other. Now the elder brother is supposed to be the one who receives the birthright by custom and culture of those times. But in these stories we see that the younger brother is chosen to receive the birthright. The birthright represents the redemption of mankind, symbolically, of anybody, everybody in the world who recognizes the sin of the human nature, whether it be the personal sin in our human nature or whether it be the sin of our people group, our culture, our ancestors, or simply in our family, mom and dad, or brother and sister. And so God in this story in Genesis 25, ultimately, not to go into the details, Jacob receives the birthright because he chooses God. Because he chooses God. Esau wanted the birthright because he got a double portion of the land that his father owned. And Isaac was very rich with much cattle, oxen, sheep, camels, etc. And Esau wanted that. A lesson symbolically again. Are you in the world just to gather goods, to gather riches, If so, those become your God. And God will let you see if it can save you. It's the 
I don't know how to say this, but God cannot force you to be saved. And so he sends a message and he says, don't look to the things of the world. Yeah, there's riches, there's wealth, but choose me. Choose my way. Yes, today you will have less if you are with God. But what is God promising you? Peace, joy, eternal life, and and happiness that increases each day. So then would God not be just in sending a warning message? And the warning message is in every book of the Bible, just in a different package. We see the warning message in Genesis, but it's all in story form, usually. And the prophets speak very, very plainly. Now, for us, the language is a little difficult, but it was very easy for the people of the time to understand. And so, when we look at Obadiah, Obadiah is a prophet of Judah, which Judah is the southern portion of the nation of the Jews, which was two parts at this time, a north kingdom, Israel, and a south kingdom, Judah. The kingdom in the south, Judah, continued on until the time of Christ. The people of of uh, Israel had eventually been taken away in captivity and were considered completely lost from there. So, I mentioned this because we talked about this the first time. Edom is technically representative of the world. So this is a prophet of God's people giving a message to the world. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. Now, in our story we read that Esau, he was red all over. Red has several meanings in the Bible, but one of them is simply sin. He's a a representation of a sinner that is unrepentant and doesn't really want to serve God. So here it says, we have heard, verse 1, Obadiah, we have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Now what's interesting about verse 1, 2? Edom represents the world, or a man in sin. We have, we have heard a rumor, a word, a message from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. So this is interesting. We have an ambassador that's sent among the heathen. And Esau is not a people of God. So technically, both of these groups, the singular Edom and then the heathen group, they're not people of God. They're not in a favorable position with God. And God is saying to them, Repent. But here, the last part of verse 1, Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. So what is this? Verse 2, Obadiah. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart, verse 3, hath deceived thee, Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? So when we look at this, the heathen, an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, so it's telling the people who are not 
favorable to God, who are not servants of God, arise. Go to war. Against who? Against a nation that I'm bringing judgment against. Edom. But the people who are bringing judgment against Edom themselves are not in favor with God. Verse 2 confirms this by saying, Behold, I've made thee small among the heathen. So the heathen is signified, categorized in relation to God as a person or persons or people or a nation that hates God, that doesn't follow God. But Edom, who represents a sinner, the two types of people groups, the righteous being Jacob, the wicked being Esau, Edom, thou art greatly despised. I hope you can catch this. When you look at the world today, you can look at any country, you can look at any people group, you can look at the competing corporations, the Fortune 500 companies, the people on Wall Street, the politicians, as in the like the senators, congressmen, in relation to the presidents and prime ministers, or the cabinet of the world leaders versus their leader, if it's a president, prime minister, king, versus their congressmen, senators, or judges in the judicial system or the corporations, or the general public, or the workers within a corporation, or the CEOs, executives within a corporation, fighting one against another. The Bible here says, Arise ye, let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. Dear sister, dear brother, dear listener, if you stay in sin, you will be greatly despised by the very people who you think love you. The people that you snort cocaine with, the people you drink beer with, the people you dance with, the people you have sex with, the people you go and shop with to your heart's content, the people who you sit and feast and party with to the overindulgence of your appetite, to the people you go out and you play sports and games with, the same team, same league, the people you work in sales and work in the finance department or the IT department or the nursing staff or the doctors or your classmates and schoolmates and you just hang out together but you're all in sin. Eventually, you will be despised. The only way you can get away from being despised is if you become a person of God. Now, God's people are hated, clearly. But if I haven't implied this and said this already, it needs to be said now. The messages of the Word of God are geared especially for the people of the last generation at the time just before Jesus returns. So in other words, the signs and symbols, the later it gets in the history of the world, the more accurate, the more pertinent, the more impetus they have in the current day. The later the day gets in the history, 
and we can see protest after protest after protest in America. We have the whites on one side, the blacks on one side, now the Asians are on one side, and the Hispanics, the Latinos, and the people from the islands and the other groups, the indigenous people, and everybody separating. And But they're saying, let's be together, let's love one another without Jesus, without the Holy Spirit, without God the Father, it cannot happen. And the heathen, the world, says we don't want God. Get rid of the Bible. Get rid of the laws of God. We can marry anybody. We can marry two women or two men. We can change our sex. Let's make marijuana legal. We made alcohol legal in 1920s or something. Marijuana is now, and what's next? They're working on the LSD and cocaine and crystal meth. Those will be legal if time goes on long enough. Don't be confused. The world in complete lawlessness. But let's take crystal meth or alcohol. Very interesting that an alcoholic, a drug addict, even a person who is obsessed with extreme sports, they have to go train hours and hours and days and weeks. And People are hated within their own families because they're separated from their families and or are doing destructive things to themselves and other people. Despised. Behold, I've made thee small among the heathen, thou art greatly despised. Sitting on the top of the world, got all the money, you're finally rich. Your name is finally Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk or Bill Gates, Donald Trump. And people hate you and you got all the money and they said, well, if you get all the money, people will love you. People will respect you. Thou art greatly despised. But that happens on a smaller scale, folks. Don't just look at those big names and say, wow, yeah, I'm glad I'm not that. Well, be a child of God. Obadiah 3, verse 3. Pride, the pride of thine heart have deceived thee into thinking everybody would love you and it would be okay. You'd be safe. Just get a little bit more money. You'll be protected from pestilence, economic downturn. The only salvation is in God. Obadiah 3, Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? So you got all that you want in life. Oh yeah, maybe you're not one of the richest hundred people in America or the world. But you have your little house or your little apartment and you're comfortable and you still have pride and you're like well I've got my 401k I'm making $15 an hour I have my degree got my second degree got my doctorate thou dwellest in the clefts of the rock over the eye of three whose habitation is high, that sets in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? You've been listening to those salesmen that tell you, well, you know, if you just invest in this, it'll protect you when there's a stock market crash. 
make sure you have health insurance and you'll be fine. Make sure you have this type of job, you'll have job security. Make sure you buy a house like this, you'll be okay. Well, let's look at Edom here, Collapse of the Rock. We're in the computer age and internet and all that, and most of you probably got a cell phone right at your fingertips. There's a place called Petra. Look that up. Petra. Go to Wikipedia. Look up Petra. Petra is a magnificent archaeological, architectural, engineered city carved out of rock, red rock, exquisite, gorgeous, beautiful. Photographers love it. I haven't been there, but as a photographer, I'd love to go. Red Rock, wow, beautiful. But this city, they carved it out of rock. And when you understand the times back then, it was very important to build a culture, a system, a city that could not be destroyed and that you could easily defend. And according to the logic of the time, it was quite near impossible to lay siege on Edom and defeat them because their city was carved out of rock. And it was very, it wasn't very easy to get to. It was very difficult. And that makes it very easy to defend. Obadiah 3, the pride of thine heart. We're great engineers. We're great architects. We're great military leaders. We're great civil engineers, planners for the city. Our governors and congressmen and senators have laid down plans. Our infrastructure is the best in the world. Health care is best in the world. Our bridges and our roads and our traffic lights and our transportation system, our manufacturing is the best in the world. It will never fail. That's what they thought in Texas a couple of months ago. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the rocks, the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring us down to the ground? So Edom had a lot of pride. But God said, no. It has to come down. Now, keep in mind, God's implied message always. The only refuge, the only refuge is the rock, Jesus Christ. Matthew 7, except ye build on the rock. Except ye build on Christ. When the wind comes, when the storm comes, what's the wind, the storm? Symbolically in the Bible, a time or the time of trouble. Your house is going to be washed away. The sand is representative of the world. The foundations of the world are sand, folks. The U.S. dollar, even the people who don't re read the Bible... The economists, the financiers, they understand. Practically worthless. People think it has value. So that's what keeps the economy going. But the day they don't think it has value, everything changes in a moment. But that thought, the paper didn't change from day to day. The gold or the 
copper or the tin or the zinc or whatever the pennies and the nickels and the quarters and the half dollars and dollars are made out of, that hasn't changed. There's still paper money and coin money all over the world, but all of a sudden it's valueless. How so? Who shall bring thee down to the ground? Obadiah 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thine will I bring thence. Thence will I bring thee down, except the Lord. Don't miss the message of the Lord here. changing here a little bit in verse 5 as he keeps going. If these came to thee, Edom, Obadiah 5, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the wine gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? Wouldn't they leave something? What's the Lord saying here? What's going on? Well, you know, when people rob, they go into a building, and of course, they take things, what's valuable to them. But, simple question, if you drive up in a car, assuming you didn't come with like 118 wheelers, do you have room to get everything out of the house? No. So you see a few valuable things and you take them. Or, better said, you probably just have a sack. You got your two arms. You take what you can put in your hands and what you can carry out, and that's all. Even though you might see a gold brick in the corner, if you can't carry it, you have to leave it. Mercy. In a way. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Verse 19. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. So notice this, folks. Back in those days, it was a rule a law, a commandment by God that when you went on your farm and you finished the harvest, cut down what you cut down for the day, for the harvest, and what you forget or what you can't get in that time, leave it out there. For what purpose? For the stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow. Have mercy. Let them have some free food. Let them gather your corn and your grapes and your figs and your apples and your wheat. Maybe they have no money. Maybe they do have some land. They Maybe they're not going to eat it, but they can go and take those seeds and plant and have a harvest for next year. Bless your neighbor. Give to your neighbor. But notice, Deuteronomy 24 20. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the vows again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. 
And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. So the Jews understood that God here is saying, this time, Edom, turn. Edom, repent. But Edom would not repent. The world is not in a state of repentance. Verse 5, Obadiah, If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? What is God saying? When I pass judgment this time, here in the end of the world, on the Asians, on the Africans, on the Europeans, on the Americans, North, Central, South Americans, the Islanders. When I pass judgment this time, I'm not leaving any grapes, not leaving any wheat. There's going to be no mercy. No mercy. Verse 6, Obadiah. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the ground. Don't miss this, folks. Verse 7, Obadiah. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and have and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, except the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. In verse 9 is confirming what we were mentioning in verse 5, everyone who doesn't repent is cut off. But when you think of the principles of God that we just read in Deuteronomy, God wants everybody to have. God wants us all to receive mercy, but Edom wasn't giving mercy. It says the merciful will receive mercy, and if you aren't merciful, you don't receive mercy. Obadiah, verse 10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Let's finish here for the day. I read all those verses. We're going to wrap them together. And now we're going to see the ultimate application. So we've seen from verse 1 and 2, an ambassador goes among the heathen. Arise ye. Let us rise up against her in battle. Edom is made small and despised. What does this mean? When we in our Bibles understand, once again, the messages have all the same objectives, talking about the same thing, but the language is different from book to book to book to book. When we go to Revelation, chapter 16, well, maybe I should go back to 13 first. Revelation, chapter 13, 
there's a law made by the people of the world. We know that this is going to be a national Sunday law in the United States of America. And there's going to be a law, a demand, that people go and worship God in a church on Sunday. This goes directly against what the Word of God would have man to do. Now, God calls this the mark of the beast. And this mark of the beast, Revelation 13, verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that is as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So here in Revelation 13, verses 15, 16, and 17, we have this mark of the beast. And if this beast, his image, don't receive worship, a person can't buy or sell. Folks, is this far-fetched? Not now. It should be easy to see. Maybe everybody online. I've been to the gas station. Put my card in the machine or pay at the cashier and my debit card. Because I don't have a credit card. I have a debit card. It doesn't work. The bank cut it off. Couldn't get gas. I have to call in. Luckily, usually I'm able to call in. I've been out of the country before one or two times. And they say, oh, your activity looks strange. And, oh, well, yeah, I'm down here in South America and I'm buying stuff. And But it's very difficult when you're making a transaction, especially if it's a plane ticket. It really snafus you. You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. So this image to the beast, it's the, the beast system, the world system. We'll come back to this in a couple of weeks, but to bridge the gap, the Bible has seven last plagues in Revelation chapter 16. And when we get down into the sixth plague, Revelation sixteen twelve, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The kings of the east are the redeemed of God. The Euphrates River symbolically are the people of the world, the heathen in Obadiah. And so when we look at this in Revelation 17, verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receives power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb. Now keep in mind in Obadiah and in Genesis, God's people, Israel, Jacob, Esau represents the people of the world. Now here in Revelation, we understand in this final ultimate antitype, this battle is against 
the Lord, the Lord's people, and Satan and his people, because the mark of the beast, Revelation 13, the authority, the power, the seat, come from the dragon, the devil, Satan. But here in Revelation 17, 14, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. This is what Obadiah is talking about, but in different language. Folks, as the message says, I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know who I'm speaking to through a medium of radio and internet recordings that can travel and be downloaded, which I hope if you do, download these and spread them, send them to your friends. Revelation 18 says, I saw another angel. Coming down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. Folks, it's easy to see the world is turning into a habitation of devils. We're fighting on every side. The only safety will be in God's hands, in God's refuge, with God's people, under the covenant of God. We have to come into the fold of God. Because Revelation 18, every foul spirit and every unclean and hateful bird and Revelation 18.3, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of fornications. All nations, Asian nations, African islanders, Australia, North, Central, South Americas, Europe, all nations serve the God of heaven, dear sister. Serve the God of heaven, dear brother. Obadiah 4.10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee. The Israelites, the ancient Israelites, we didn't read a lot. But in what we read in Deuteronomy, you see we are to have mercy on our neighbor. If you have a neighbor and they don't have, or you have and you can't give, and you don't give, the curse of God will be with you. Bless your neighbor. Don't curse your neighbor. And if you bless your neighbor, he may stay your neighbor in heaven. That's the whole idea. And then we'll be happy and we'll be under our fig tree. We'll be next to our grapevine and we'll have peace forever. This is what God wants you to have. But if you commit violence against your neighbor, Oh, and you may not have a gun or a knife, but if you're keeping your neighbor from having his needs and oppressing him, that's violence in the eyes of the Lord. Shame on you. Obadiah 10, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, and especially if it's against the church, Jesus, his people, and you rail against the church, even if your church, even if all the pastors are wicked and apostate, keep your mouth shut. Pray to God. Fast and pray for them. And ask God to have mercy on them. And you have mercy on them if they need something. As wicked as they might be. God says, be nice to the neighbor. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee. If we continue in that, folks, these last words in verse 10, last eight words, and thou shalt be cut off forever. 
the grape gatherers will come through your house, through the land, America, Europe, Asia, Africa, the islands, and God's going to destroy everything that will not be merciful and loving and kind to his neighbor. Don't have shame covering you. I hope you'll study further the principles of God and learn to trust this God of love who wants to, us to be a blessing to every neighbor around us who he considers our brothers and that we might represent God and reveal God to the world that the God of heaven is actually God of love. And we can escape his judgments, but by believing in him and demonstrating his love to your neighbor. This is the message of God. Let's say a word of prayer and close. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for the plan of salvation. Let it be that your blessings and your grace will be with us, your Holy Spirit, as we by faith take hold of your words and live them so that we can be a blessing to our neighbors around us, that they can escape the coming judgments and be in the fold and refuge that you have provided and that we too can be there and that we can be in joy and in peace throughout eternity, worshiping before thy throne, sitting by our grapevines and under our fig trees, eating pomegranates and singing praises to your great name. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name and blood, amen. This is Dr. Courtney Jackson. My ministry is Revelation of Him. You can find us on the web at www.revelationofhem.org. Remember, we are a ministry that operates on faith. We need your contributions. So we're looking to uh, build a, a uh, medical missionary gospel worker school, and we need to buy land and provide for this ministry, and you can deposit in our account at Bank of America, account number 21486322228 through Zeal, or by Cash App, PayPal, but until uh, two weeks from now, God be with you all. Uh, moderator, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sister Joanna, are you on? Um, I'm going to close out uh, for Sister Joanna. She might be muted. She doesn't know. No, she texted me. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I'm going to close out for her. She... um, was having some problems okay. with the phone. So I was Thank just you. checking to make sure. Um, so you've already um, given me contact information. Thank you so much for that. Yes. And, um, yeah. And for anyone, um, that would like to hear this message again or share it with someone else, you can do so by dialing 712-775-7089. Thank you, told you youth, for dialing in for the live call, 555-145-POUND. Now, Our message, this message is available on our Facebook page. It will be when we post that. And you can go there and download the message at absolutely no cost. You can go to our email address of AV for voice, OOC, 2019 at gmail.com. Or go to our website, the voice of one crank in the wilderness dot com, 
And there, uh, you can request this message to be um, emailed to you at no cost. Um, And if that is not available uh, for you, you can uh, contact us at the Voice of One Crying in the Wilderness. Um, Our P.O. Box is 8441. Laverne, and that's L-A-V-E-R-N-E, California, 91750-8441. And with a donation of $5 to cover the cost of materials and shipping. And your check or money order would be made payable to Brother Vaughn Williams. We want to thank all of our callers that unite with us on a daily basis, praying for this ministry, all the ministries that are connected with it. We want to thank those that financially unite with us to support the other ministries here and speakers that come on. And um, I always like to pause and say thank you to all of our callers across this country and uh, as well as those in other countries. Thank you for taking time out of your day to hear the message that God has for his people in these last days. And for those that are seeking um, prayer requests, you can go to our Facebook page, and post it there. You can go to our website, and you need to press on Contact Us, and you can make uh, your prayer request there as well. Or you may text or call Sister Jackie at 773-415-1562. Again, that's 773-415-1562. And by God's grace, you can now hear us as serving with a mission dot org and in closing. Oh, I forgot, excuse me. I forgot to tell you that our speaker for tomorrow evening will be that of Elijah Rogers. He will be our speaker for tomorrow. And in closing, amid discord and strife, a voice was heard from the wilderness, a voice startling yet stern and full of hope. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Desire of Ages, page 104. God bless And we look forward to fellowshipping with everyone again 